And thanks to everyone for your, uh, your attention today as well. I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen and we can begin. Just let me know if you can see the presentation itself. Does it look okay? Yeah, looks good. Thanks, Katie. So first of all, um, what a, a big thank you to Melvin for inviting me in to come talk to you today. I've had the good fortune to work with Melvin for a number of years. And, um, and I'm currently working at the International Energy Agency as a SACON from Michelle, where I support supply and investment um, for energy, for our World Energy Outlook. And I had the very good fortune of working with this brilliant team on this report on the role of critical minerals in clean energy transitions. And so I will be stepping through um, about 30 minutes or so of presentation and then into questions. I can't guarantee that I will be able to answer all of the questions, but I think that we'll learn a lot from each other as we go through the course of the evening. And, uh, and I look forward to, to hearing your thoughts as we, as we go into the questions. Um, so please do put your questions into the chat and uh, we'll go ahead and start. So to begin with, our starting point um, is really over about the last, say, 18 months. Um, so over the last 18 months, we have seen a huge growth in the pledges that countries and governments have made to reach net zero emissions by mid-century or shortly thereafter. And so more than 40 countries and the EU have now committed to this goal. So these countries represent about 70% of today's global, uh, global GDP, so the gross domestic product or essentially a measure of the size of the economy, and also about 70% of emissions as well. But of course, these pledges are only the start of this journey. And if these are followed through to actually take them through into um, implementation, it means certainly a massive acceleration in clean energy deployment. And with this, it means that there will be a lot more electric vehicles, wind turbines, solar panels, electricity transmission and distribution lines. And these are all essential to move us onto a more sustainable path and avoid the most severe impacts of, of climate change. But in turn, it also means that a lot more of these minerals and metals will be going into different technologies. So lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and graphite are all crucial to battery performance, longevity, and energy density. Rare earth elements are needed for permanent magnets that are vital for wind turbines, but also for EV motors as well. Solar panels are not in and of themselves very mineral intensive, but the sheer size of the future solar market means there are plenty of additional demand coming forward for silicon, silver, and copper. And also the infrastructure for a cleaner and more electrified system is one that's built on, on the electricity energy system. So we need quite a bit more copper for, um, for all electricity related technologies and the expansion of electricity grids means we need much more copper and aluminum. But many of these technologies that we need for a clean energy future require significantly more minerals than what their fossil fuel based counterparts do. So, and I'll take one, just a moment to say, we have not included steel in this analysis or aluminum, aluminum. Um, outside of electricity networks. And so this remains um, striking to see the changes in mineral use though, applied across the energy transitions. So let's, if we start with a typical electric car, an electric car requires about six times more mineral inputs than a conventional car. And similarly, if we look at offshore wind, an offshore wind plant takes and requires about 13 times more minerals than a natural gas fired power plant. So over the last 10 years, renewables have started to dominate investment in, in power generation and clean energy technology. So as a result, the average amount of mineral used has increased um, per unit of power generation capacity, the amount of minerals has increased, increased about 50%. So the world has enough resources to make energy transitions work, but there's no guarantee that the supply of those resources 
are going to be available when we need them and where we need them and at an affordable price. So one of the key messages that comes out of this analysis, no matter what you believe with respect to climate change or where you believe the, the timing or the pace of energy transition will take, um, critical minerals are going to be a, a, a huge and important part and a lever as well in the energy transition. They're becoming an increasingly important part of the energy debate, but also of the global energy security discussion as well. So the challenges that they pose in energy transitions can be manageable, but they require early attention from policymakers to make sure that these transitions um, can be secure, sustainable, rapid enough, and affordable. So I wanna first walk us through a picture of, of demand and how fast could demand rise for these minerals. So we conducted our assessment looking across different scenarios and 11 different technology uh, evolution pathways. And the short answer is that a concerted effort to reach global climate goals will require at least a quadrupling of overall mineral requirements by 2040. To meet, a, to meet a scenario, to meet a projection that is consistent with the Paris Agreement. And so here we show the sustainable development scenario, which is a scenario that is put out by the World Energy Outlook by the team that I work with. And that scenario is consistent with Paris and it meets net zero emissions by 2070. In a scenario that meets net zero emissions by 2050, this grows even faster and requires six times more mineral inputs in 2040 than today. The main factor behind this growth is in EVs and battery storage. But also then just behind that, you see the growth in electricity networks followed by power generation. In a climate-driven scenario, demand for lithium in particular sees rapid growth. It varies depending on the precise strength of climate policies and the technology pathway, but in a scenario compatible with Paris, in this case SDS, so net zero by 2070, demand for lithium is more than 40 times higher than in 2040, or sorry, than in 2020. And this is followed by graphite, cobalt, and nickel that are around 20 to 25, followed by rare earth elements. So there are two important consequences for this demand picture. First, it means that the energy sector is becoming a major source of demand for minerals, and that has not traditionally been the case. So if we take lithium, for example, 10 years ago, demand for lithium for energy-related applications was minimal, but already in 2020, EVs and battery storage have displaced consumer electronics to become the largest single consumer of lithium. And if we get on a trajectory consistent with the Paris Agreement, that means that 90% of the global lithium supply will go to the energy sector by 2040. And this trend is similar in other minerals, but not as dramatic as in lithium. The second implication relates to the cost structure of producing clean energy technologies themselves. So we're all aware that technology, learning, and economies of scale are bringing the cost of key energy technologies down. But as this happens, the costs of the raw materials are now starting to account for a larger percentage of the total. It means that batteries, for example, Five years ago, they or compared to five years ago, batteries are much cheaper than, um, sorry, batteries today are much cheaper than they were five years ago. But the relative percentage of raw material costs in the total cost of batteries has risen to be about 50 to 70%. And so that translates to any volatility that we have in the raw materials associated with minerals means it gets directly transferred on to the consumers. Um, that, are, that are using those. And this means that volatile, min, volatile mineral, mineral prices could have a huge and significant impact on the global ability to transform our energy system. So not just for batteries, but translating that discussion across to, um, to power generation, solar PV, 
and to grids as well. So let's take it, I wanna take one slide to step through what this means for, for mining companies and the changing fortune and opportunities as well for mining companies and the energy sector on the whole. The implications are, are pretty dramatic. So if we move forward in a climate scenario, compared to 2020, so in 2020, energy transmission, energy transition minerals are only about a 10th of the global revenue of coal. But in a climate scenario, that is in a climate scenario that's consistent with Paris, then coal declines quite rapidly. And there's a reversal of fortunes in the scenarios there or that meet these climate goals. And energy transition minerals gain a tailwind from this growing demand and upward pressure on prices. So combined revenues from energy transition minerals, which overtake coal well before 2040, um, provide an interesting opportunity and a strategic opportunity for many companies. And some companies are already taking that. So some are moving out of coal, moving out of thermal coal, um, as they start to position themselves in different strategic markets for energy transition minerals. However, this does not mean that there's necessarily a smooth transition coming for employment out of these sectors. There are some countries like South Africa and Australia that have reasonable and ample resources of not just coal, but other transition minerals as well. However, that's not true everywhere. And there are some significant risks associated um, and challenges with the social consequences of making this just transition. In turn, as we start to look at the supply chains and the risks around supply chains, minerals create a much more um, different and interesting picture perhaps than their fossil fuel or oil uh, and gas equivalents. These high, there are high, I should say there, there's an essential point with the production of, of many energy transition minerals, and they're quite more concentrated in, in specific countries around the world as compared to oil and gas, for example. And this high level of concentration, when you compound that with compl complex supply chains, increases the risks that there may be physical disruption, trade restrictions, um, or other developments in some of the major producing countries that would translate to volatility in prices. So for lithium, cobalt, and rare earth elements, the world's top three producing nations control well over three quarters of global output. And in some cases, like cobalt, as many of us are aware, the Democratic Republic of Congo accounts for 70% of global cobalt production. China is responsible for about 60% of rare earth production. But it's not just the extraction and production of those directly from the ground, it's also the processing side of the supply chain. Um, that we need to take a look at. And this processing side is even more concentrated with China being the decisive player in many of these areas. So China has invested heavily in these mineral supply chains to help ensure that it can support its growth in the battery industry, manufacture wind turbines, solar panels, um, and also for the expansion of its own grid. And that leads to really a, quite, a key, quite a key question and if mineral demand starts to pick up globally, as it would if today's climate pledges turn into action, then will supply across the supply chain be able to keep up with demand as it moves forward? We would start to look more closely into the specific supplies associated um, with the energy transmission transition minerals that we've been talking about. And as we look closely at today's production capacity and the new projects that are under production, you can see those results on the screen for copper, lithium, and cobalt. And in essence, as things stand out, the production outlook is geared towards a world of gradual, insufficient action on climate change. So we don't see any significant growth with what is currently producing or under construction. This, but if we start to look ahead in a climate scenario, we start to see this mismatch. 
So we're seeing a looming mismatch between the world's strength and climate ambitions and the supply of critical minerals that are essential to realizing those ambitions. And this mismatch is, is not uniform across the board. So while the balance for lithium products and nickel and key rare earth elements looks to be much tighter. If we look ahead in a scenario consistent with climate goals, the expected supply of lithium and cobalt from existing mines and projects under construction meet only half of the projected requirements that we see to 2030. And that is based on the SDS. So that's a scenario that's consistent with net zero in 2070, not net zero in 2050. So one precondition to narrow this gap is for policymakers to be very clear about their long-term goals, or in the case of 2030, their medium-term goals, um, and to fill in the details of how they really plan to get there. This means that clear milestones for action and near-term clean energy deployment are needed for this decade. And that will be really vital to reduce investment risks and encourage capital to be flowing into these different sectors. But there, there are other factors in play. So new projects typically have quite long um, and significant lead times. So we assume an average of four to five years on average for construction alone, as well as additional time for preparation and permitting. And these long lead times would need to be shortened quite considerably in order to see a very quick um, and prolonged ramp up that we see or think we're going to need in supply. But there are some other supply challenges as well. And one of those is around the type of resources and the quality of resources. So there are no shortage of, of, of theoretical resources for these minerals, but the highest quality ores and those best resources are depleting. So for example, in Chile, the average copper grade or uh, for the, uh, sorry, the average copper ore grade has declined by about 30% in 15 years. So lower quality ores mean that it will take more energy to produce them. It'll put upward pressure on production costs. There will be more emissions, more waste volumes. And if the environmental records are not held to task, more pollution as well. So the ability of supply to keep up with the acceleration in energy transitions should really not be taken for granted. We step through also the question of, of overall life cycle emissions um, in the climate scenario and what this means for, uh, for, our mineral, for our minerals as well. So as we put this together, the one question we heard really regularly was, was how clean are the clean technologies really? So once you account for all of the emissions across the mineral, uh, the mineral supply chain. So to answer this question, we looked at the emissions associated from a gasoline fueled car, so an internal combustion car, and started to compare that to its battery electric vehicle equivalent. And you see here the emissions from, from the IC. And most of, the, most of the life cycle emissions are associated with the, uh, the burning of the fuel associated with the car. If we look at the battery equivalent, we see that there are slightly higher emissions coming from the mining, the assembly, and the vehicle manufacturing associated with the electric vehicle. But then it really comes down to, um, it really comes down to the electricity used to power the vehicle itself. So in a world that takes, um, and we also took a look to see, you know, if we, we take essentially also the highest life cycle emissions that we could find from reporting, and look that, looked at that against also um, uh, the base level as well. Taking a look at how much electricity and the emissions associated from the electricity though, um, indicates that you're seeing less than half in our base case, less than half of the emissions coming from an electric vehicle as you would with an internal combustion engine. And then even in the case where we have a much higher, much more intensive, um, uh, sourcing of minerals, you're still just under half of the emissions on a life cycle perspective. And if we look forward in a climate scenario where electricity generation is cleaner, then that impact becomes even less. And we have that from, um, from our base case scenario. 
I wanted to take a couple of slides. We had just released the World Energy Outlook yesterday for those that may have seen some of those headlines come across in the news. And I wanted to grab just a few of those slides from the Outlook and, and put them in here to give a sense of, of what our latest analysis is and what it means for critical minerals. So in this analysis, we took a look and we wanted to see how we thought the energy trade moving forward would evolve in our different scenarios. And looking back to 2019, before some of the demand losses associated with COVID, oil was responsible for about two thirds of the value of energy related resource trade, or um, two thirds of about 1.5 trillion US dollars. In a scenario that where the countries that have pledged their net zero pledges um, actually grow and to meet them, we see by 2050 that this is about the same size of overall energy related resource trade, about $1.5 trillion. But oil has started to step back and where oil steps back, critical minerals steps up. So critical minerals grows from about 11% to about 18%. In a scenario consistent with net zero, meeting net zero by mid-century, then critical minerals grows to take over half of the energy-related resource trade, and oil drops down considerably. When we look at the size of investments and where minerals are going into the investment picture for different clean energy technologies, referring back to where we started, um, we started our talk, comparing the, the size of the oil market to the size of clean tech, that starts to grow. And by 2050, then clean technology investment is about $1.2 trillion, of which 60% of that is associated with batteries. And so again, those are EV batteries and batteries that are used for, for larger storage as well. I'm gonna close out the slide the IA had put together six different pillars or recommendations with respect to critical minerals and the growth and support of critical minerals in a clean energy transition. This rising importance of critical minerals in a fast changing energy world requires energy policymakers to expand their horizons and consider what new vulnerabilities are in play and also what new responses they may need to make as well. And the first of these is to help ensure that there are adequate levels of investment in diversified sources of supply. So as we looked at earlier, there are some early and clear signals that are needed from policymakers that are critical to give companies confidence that they are really needing to commit, that they are really needing in order to commit to new supply. But as everyone that is familiar with energy security knows is that needs to be a diversified sources of supply. In this context, resource owning governments can support new project development by helping to reinforce national geologic surveys, streamlining permitting procedures to shorten some of those lead times and helping to provide financing to de-risk, especially the early phases of the projects. And raising public awareness and public support for, for the sector will also be critical to help ensure that projects can move forward to meet supply. One of the key insights from the IEA's long history in energy security is that it, however, cannot solely focus on supply. The other thing that's needed from governments is to promote new technology innovation at all points along the value chain. And that can help to alleviate strains on supply, especially those that we are seeing related to, to mineral intensity and also the declining, um, declining relative resource quality. And this may also help to open up new sources of substitution that we're seeing that may be quite critical, um, especially in battery chemistry. So for one example, if you look at the solar PV supply chains and how that's evolved, particularly over the last 10 years, we've seen 40 to 50% reduction in the use of silver in silicon and solar cells in the last decade. And that's been quite critical to help, um, to help drive down some of the costs that we're seeing and improve solar PV deployment around the world. A third area that's quite important, and the one that I had researched quite heavily for this report, is in the area of recycling. And so recycling is well established for some of the larger 
bulk, um, bulk metals and, and minerals, but it's really focused around steel, aluminum, copper, and nickel to some degree as well, but it's not well established and much more difficult in some cases, for example, for lithium and rare earth elements. And so this will have to change across many, many of the mineral supply chains moving into the future. Um, as the amount of spent EV batteries that are reaching their end of life surges after 2030. With opportunities largest in some of those countries that are really seeing the early stages of deployment. And so the UK being, being one of those. As we start to move ahead in 2040, you start to see that some of these volumes um, and recycling these volumes won't eliminate the need for continued investment in new supply. They're just growing, they're just growing too fast, and, and recycling has some limitations as well. But we estimate that by 2040, recycled volumes and quantities for copper, lithium, nickel, and cobalt from spent batteries could reduce um, primary supply by around 10%. If we look and take um, a short discussion on the resilience of supply chains and also market transparency, we know from our existing emergency response programs that we have, for example, with oil, our regular market assessments, good um, regular market assessments, good data, um, and also periodic stress tests that policymakers can do, and that can help to identify weak points that we have across our supply chain. There also may be a consideration for strategic stockpiling for some supplies that may be able to help countries weather some short-term supply disruptions. Fifth, for those that have worked in the mining sector, there, there is a need to maintain higher environmental, social, and governance standards. And that helps to include and support um, some of the emissions, the local, local pollution, but also the treatment of worker safety and welfare. Because from the view of the IEA, the solutions to climate change cannot work on the back of injustices or poor environmental performance. <laughs> Suppliers have to do their own due diligence to identify, assess, and mitigate some of these risks. And finally, this will all have to rely on, inter -collaborate, on international collaboration between producers and consumers. And so these six, pillar to, six pillars together are the basis for the IEA's new approach to mineral security and one that will continue to develop, to develop and expand and understand as we move forward. And so from this, I'll, I'd love to open it up to questions. And, and I hope you have some, and I hope I can answer some as well. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen, but I'm, I'm happy to go back um, and review any, any slides that we may have some questions on.